man, I barely know where to begin other than to just say thank you so much. I'm assuming the title of this video is in some way gonna mention that I hit 10,000 subscribers. That happened overnight, two nights ago, and it's something that just feels like a huge milestone for the channel and something I'm immensely grateful for. I've been doing weekly uploads for almost four years, actually maybe over four years now. I think in the middle of 2019 is when I started doing weekly videos. I think I missed a week or two. I don't know if it's been a perfect streak, but regardless, it's, it's been pretty consistent and definitely the most consistent creative business project I've ever done that I've ever been a part of. And I feel like it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it, you know, the reason any of this has happened is because of you, viewers like you, you know, if nobody watched my videos, I don't know if I would have kept making them. If no one subscribed to the channel, I'd like to believe I, you know, I know I would still make music and I would still be creative, but it's the support and the feedback that I get from the commenters and the subscribers on my videos like you who have made me want to keep doing this and have made this such a rewarding endeavor. And so I want to just talk about how I got here, where the channel is at now, what my goals were, did I accomplish them? So let's talk about that. I have been buying music gear and using music gear for years and years and years, well before I started this channel. And part of why I wanted to start the channel was a hope that I could potentially even out the cost of the music gear if I was able to get a channel that got big enough that it could make some money and potentially get some free music gear, I could monetize that specific part of my hobby. I've wanted to be really careful about the idea of taking the fun away or the joy away from music production. So I definitely didn't want the channel to just become some craven business enterprise, and it's certainly not. I've turned down plenty of really weird <laughs> ad emails and I get a lot of spammy emails about different iPad cases and stands and thing like, things like that where I'm like, it's not really the right fit for this channel. I've turned down ad opportunities as well for larger things that would have been, you know, minute long ads that I just, if it didn't feel relevant for the people who watch my videos, it just didn't feel like the right fit. So I, I said no. But I will say that in the process of making these videos and continuing to grow the channel over the last four years, I have achieved a lot of the goals that I set out to accomplish. So. The channel regularly makes about between 2,000 and 3,000 in AdSense in the last two years. And that's pre-tax, so there's definitely less after tax. And the expenses on the channel definitely exceed the revenue of the channel. But a lot of those expenses are things I would have bought anyway. So I still view it as a huge success and a huge honor that people are interested enough in my channel to let it basically become self-supporting, at least to a degree. Along with that, I've been able to partner with brands in a way that's been not always perfect. I, I wouldn't say I've always nailed it. The recent Control Mark III video is a good example of where that can backfire, but I would say for the most part, working with Akai, working with Native Instruments, uh, to a lesser degree, PolyEnd, not lesser in that they weren't great to work with, they were, it was just more of like a $150 discount rather than getting to borrow gear or getting free gear to keep. All of them have been really lovely, kind to work with, and I was actually kind of surprised that some of them wanted to work with me, just given that I was a fairly vocal critic of a lot of the gear before they reached out. Although I also did reach out on my own too. I think for both Polly and Akai, I reached out to them, which I, I would say, you know, I'll, I'll talk more about my advice I would give people, but that is something I would say, don't hesitate to reach out to people in a kind and collaborative way. You know, if you have a channel with no subscribers that no one is watching, you might have some difficulty getting potential collaborators or companies to work with you. But if you're making high quality stuff that's resonating with people, I don't think it's ever a bad idea to reach out and see if companies or people wanna work with you. I would just say, approach those engagements from a genuinely kind and collaborative place and not just a sliding into a DM saying, hey, we should collab, bro. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with wanting to collaborate, I just think thinking out what you can bring to the table and what you're offering is important when you reach out in that way. But anyway, I digress. Between that and the ability to borrow gear from Zounds, uh, who have been awesome and an awesome partner of the channel, I'm at a point now where I can use most of the things I want. I can either buy things like this M2 iPad Pro or the Ableton Push 3 standalone this year. Um, you know, both of those purchases exceed how much revenue the channel will make, but the revenue the channel made helps make up a lot of that difference. On average, my channel makes about 200-ish dollars a month. If we look right now, I have made $198.99 in the last 28 days. And that is 
fairly average, I would say. I've had really good months where a video will go viral, and sometimes those videos themselves can make quite a bit of money. But most of the time, I think my videos are in the few thousand range, and that's honestly huge to me. Uh, just that so many people are even interested in what I'm doing. Even, you know, 260 people decided to watch my complete departure video of walking around downtown Portland. I expected that video to flop, and compared to the rest of my channel, I would say maybe it kind of did, but it was a fun project. I got to work with uh, my friend Andrew Williams, who I've known for a long time, only on the internet, and used some of the music from his band Fellow Hollow. I love the album they put out called Bows of Teeth, and it was really cool to, um, to get to make something a little different. But yeah, in general, you know, the videos get a few thousand views. Sometimes they get a little bit more. I'm really proud of my like ratios. I'm actually pretty bummed out that YouTube hides the like ratio now because I personally strive really hard to have a like ratio that's high and when something gets below 90%, I try to do kind of like an investigation into what did I do wrong there, what didn't resonate with people. Sometimes the video gets 100, which is wild. But yeah, if we go to, let's say, iPad Pro is finally legit, right? This is a video that went randomly viral. It's a video I actually made because I needed to have something on that weekend and uh, ended up just being really successful, which is cool. If we go to revenue, this video alone made $240, $244 off of 68,000 views. And that is one of the benefits of technology videos. I found that tech videos can get pretty good revenue back when they blow up. And music tech can as well, but not always. It kind of depends. But this is absolutely a rarity. I would say a video like the MPC key video, this is still pretty new, but on 3,000 views, it's made 20 bucks, which is cool. I got to borrow this MPC key for free. It's right here. I've been really enjoying it. I'm gonna make more videos with it from Zounds. They didn't ask for anything in return. I'll shout them out anyway. I made 20 bucks for probably five hours of work, uh, maybe a little less, let's say four hours of work. So $5 an hour, but I also got to use this keyboard for free. And 3000 people cared enough to watch what I made and a lot of people commented and told me about their experiences. Yeah, like 60 comments. Although if you're a regular commenter on my channel, you may know that I comment back and I do think it, it counts all of my comments and replies as comments. So those numbers are always a little inflated because I really like engaging with the viewers. I wanna talk a little bit about my advice for people who are starting channels or want to do this kind of thing. Recommend some of the channels that have taught me a lot and shout out some of the people who have been huge supporters since day one. So I'd say one of the best ways to learn how to make YouTube videos is to watch YouTube videos. Don't ever really get stagnant, right? So I pay attention to what gamers might call the meta in that I am constantly paying attention to what kind of videos seem to be doing well on YouTube. I learned a lot of lessons from YouTubers you might not expect. So like I, my old roommates and I got really into Mr. Beast for a bit. And that is when I stopped doing intros. After I saw how Mr. Beast did videos and it jumped immediately into paying off the title and the thumbnail, that was when I stopped doing things like, hi, I'm Dylan Paris, I'm a musician and I work in tech. Like, And even recently I've stopped asking for likes and subscribes because I, I thought that I was seeing a difference and I might have seen a difference in likes and subscribes on the videos I asked for versus the ones I didn't ask. But I would say overall, the interruption to the viewer experience outweighs to me at this point, the net benefit of potentially getting an additional like 20% likes and subscribes. I would rather people like and subscribe of their own volition because they're genuinely interested in the video and the stuff I'm making rather than doing it out of pity. That would be a big thing. And then, you know, just watching some of the greats, like the channels that inspired me are probably fairly obvious, but you've got, you know, Red Means Recording, Andrew Wong, Bo Beats. And then more recently, I think there's been a really awesome newer generation or two of tech music YouTubers. And then I think Ben Jordan's been doing it for a long time, but he's become one of my favorites. I think Ben is probably the most important YouTuber in the space right now for me, for like the work he does and what he talks about. He's made his channel a nonprofit, which is wild. But you know, Bolo the producer, Brandon Rico, Henny the business. When I started doing videos, a lot of them were iPad videos, and those are the legends in the space. I learned a lot from them. And really, there's so many, it gets hard to name, but I, I will say, I also wanna shout out some of my contemporaries, such as Slow Haste, who's been a friend of the channel for a while, Chord Master, who's been a friend of the channel for a while. It's really cool to just see other people in the space making videos and building audiences and sharing the stuff they're interested in. Hanjo Synth is someone who reached out to me pretty early in the channel just to say that he appreciated what I did and that he'd felt inspired to make a channel because of me, which is wild. Um, Son Wu started around when I started and makes awesome content as well. I could go on for days and days. Um, 
I will also say I really recommend watching YouTubers outside of the space you're in. So some of my favorite YouTubers are not music tech YouTubers. Uh, people like John Hill, who does amazing skateboarding videos. Uh, I watch a lot of tech YouTubers. Sarah Dietschy, who's John Hill's wife. I actually discovered John Hill through Sarah's videos. Folks like Louis Gusto, who does uh, travel videos. He did a lot of Chicago videos and New York videos now. A ton of lifestyle like vloggers I've gotten really into. I spend more time on YouTube than anywhere else, and I could spend hours and hours and days talking about all the YouTubers who inspired me. Um, I'll also say I have a film degree, so I went to PSU, Portland State University, for five years because uh, I took summers off to just work. And I got a degree in film and a degree in the Honors College. I will say that a film degree is absolutely unnecessary to do what I do. There's absolutely net positives. I learned how to use gear like this in a controlled environment with professionals who had experience, which is one of my favorite things about the PSU Film School was how many people weren't just teaching because they couldn't do, but were teaching because they did and wanted to show us. Like I had VFX professors and sound design professors who'd worked on like The Phantom Menace and other Lucasfilm projects, really great cinematographers, really great editors, and great students and scholars of film. And so I would say you don't need to go to film school to learn how to make videos, but there's, as time has gone by, I definitely feel like going to film school paid off and going to college in general paid off for just kind of giving me five amazing years of diving into the world of education and, and really deep diving into a lot of different topics. But I will say I came out of school with $56,000 in debt. But I would say yeah, if you wanna make videos, watch videos and start making videos. A lot of people in a lot of fields will tell you like, how do I get started? Start, start today, start yesterday. If you couldn't start yesterday, start today. If you have a phone, you probably have a camera. Um, if you really need a standalone camera, then look into a good value camera first. And there's a whole market of cameras now that are designed for people who want to do YouTube stuff, like the Sony RX100 or the ZVs or whatever they're called. Um, my first nice mirrorless camera was the Lumix GH5, and this is a Lumix S5, which is an upgrade. But honestly, I, was, I started my channel with a Samsung phone. Uh, and I film videos to this day using my iPhone 14 Pro, including that iPad Pro is finally a legit video that got 68,000 views that was filmed on my iPhone um, entirely in like 4K cinematic mode, which looked kind of goofy, but it was good enough. It didn't matter. So yeah, I really think for any creative endeavor, whether it's music production, video production, writing, drawing, you can spend a lot of time reading and studying and thinking about how you're gonna execute. And I would be a hypocrite if I didn't say that I do that with performing live music. I don't perform live music. So in that sense, I'm still doing that in my own life. But in most areas, I have tried to just do rather than just think about doing. And that has paid off dividends. And so I do recommend if you have any interest in starting a channel, if you have any interest in starting any creative work to just start, you'll make mistakes along the way, but those mistakes are lessons. Failure is a lesson. Approach it with a kindness and a genuineness. And I recommend not competing, um, at least in a lot of these spaces. I view YouTube as a collaborative space. I don't view myself as having competitors. I view myself as having peers and mentors, people I look up to, people who inspire me and people who can hold me accountable, my commenters and my viewers. I view this as a community. I think YouTube is the most successful social network of all social networks, in my opinion, because it's so constructive and so valuable in a way that I feel like most other social networks are not. It's also why I put most of my time into this one. The only other one I even really use for my music production stuff is Instagram, which you're welcome to follow, but is a lot more informal than this. Sincerely, I want to thank all of my subscribers, all of my viewers, all of my commenters, the people who make this channel a community. You are the reason I keep doing this. I know I already said that, but it's true and it can't be overstated. When I think about the future of the channel, I definitely feel like I'm in a bit of an experimental place right now. It's a funny time to hit 10,000 because I feel like I'm the most kind of in the woods uh, at sea <laughs> as I've ever been. Hitting goals is a weird feeling and I definitely feel like I'm kind of trying to figure out what my next goals are. For me, that has been focusing more on creating content I enjoy a lot, even if the content doesn't blow up as much. I wanna make sure that when I sit down to make a video, it's a video I'm really excited about making and a story I'm excited to share and not just something I'm doing because I have to make a video this week. That's why I did the walking around Portland video last week. That's why I'm just making this talking to you about my experiences with YouTube video this week. I can't promise what the future will hold because I tend to make my videos the same week they come out. And so I may change my mind, but right now I'm really thinking a lot about how to make the best quality content I can make and not focus as much on how to build a channel that makes a bunch of money. Uh, that's less interesting to me. I think the biggest goal I might still have is that my music 
still has a pretty small audience. Over the years, I have grown increasingly grateful for the fact that my music has any audience at all. The fact anyone goes out of their way to listen to my music and that it resonates with people. Music is my most important creative outlet, which is funny because I think a lot of people just know me for YouTube, which is not unusual. There's plenty of YouTubers who have a side dream of whatever else they're interested in. But music is something I've done since I was 14 years old and I'm 30 now, so over half my life. Uh, I've been doing videos longer, I suppose, but not YouTube. And I think getting to a point where I can introduce my music to my YouTube audience in an organic way that doesn't feel like an ad placement, but just feels like a natural extension of what I'm doing. I've done it before, but I wanna do that more. Part of why that's hard to do for me is that I spend a lot of time on my music. Where a video might, you know, take an afternoon or a week at most, my albums are measured in years at this point. Early on when I was making music under the name Paris Stevens and Nuclear Grizzly, those I would make much quicker. But nowadays, if I make an album under my name, Dylan Paris, I'm now spending a couple of years for each one. So the last one that came out was There's Something Better. That came out in 2020. And that was co-produced and mixed by my friend Jake Stein of the band Wrong House. Jake is a hero. He's an awesome dude and a huge inspiration to me. And we're working together on my second album, which right now is called Float. That the title might change, but I already have album art, which I'm not gonna show yet, from an amazingly talented artist I commissioned. We're in the beginnings of the mixing and mastering process, or the mixing process, we're not close to mastering yet. I am using the money I make from my job and the money I make from the channel to try to make the best project I can. Kind of like, what if I was my own label? What would I put into that? And so I'm putting in a lot of time and effort and I will pay professionals to master this next one because I mastered uh, There's Something Better Myself and I think that's the weakest point. I got a really nice review on Bandcamp that was like, this is a great album, but it could use better mastering and they were super true. And so I do want to make more projects that incorporate my music and show my music, not just my sketches that I do for these videos, but like my actual finished projects. If we sort my videos by views, we can see the most successful one I ever did was Surface Pro 8 replaced my MacBook, which is a video I mildly regret uh, just because any video I make like that gets outdated very fast and ages like milk. Akai Force is now unstoppable. It was a video that blew up that was about music tech, which was a really good feeling. Key Lab Essential also got a huge audience for some reason. And then yeah, that iPad video really blew up. Let's look at analytics here. Yeah, this Surface video made $833. I think that was in an era where YouTube was paying out more in revenue. This Akai Force video got $591, which basically almost paid off the price of the Force because I got my Force for $725. So that was a really good feeling too. The Key Lab Essential video, I think it got a lot of its views before I was monetized. Could be wrong on that. No, well, yeah, I don't know. Actually, I think I went monetized in 2020, so no. Um, but yeah, it got 300, so that paid for the keyboard, I believe. And I also ended up selling the keyboard later and making a little bit of money on that too. Oh, hey, real quick. I realized as I was about to offload the footage that I never talked about the total revenue of the channel. Um, I just like roughly estimated. So let's look at the lifetime revenue. Life, oh my God. Um, whoa. Yeah, so apparently I got 1.6 million views with 89,000 watch time hours, 10,000 subscribers, obviously, that's why we made this video, and $6,959. That's... Oh, thank you so much. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. I haven't been super open with this because I never want to brag. Like, I'm not trying to brag about <laughs> making money here, but I figured if I'm sharing insight into the channel at this point, that's worth noting. I've had a few paid sponsorships before. Some of those have been discounts, like from Perfect Circuit when I've worked with them. Um, and then DistroKid and I have worked together, and those were like flat fee ads. I don't think my audience has been super interested in signing up for stuff when I have ads. And personally, I'm not really interested in being a salesperson. I'm interested in making videos that people like. And I don't know. Again, I work a full-time job, so that's it's okay if that's where my money comes from for the most part. I used to have a Patreon. I only recently ended it, and I do want to give a huge thank you to my Patreon patrons. Let's see if I can remember them off the top of my head. Tempest Anderson was my first and the one who paid the most because I deprecated a $6 tier and they kept paying that even though I tried to deprecate it. That was really kind of them. I pawed my pants, who is my old roommate, Kiefer. Thank you, Kiefer. Um, Sigmata, Cute Story, and Derek Taylor. Um, thank you so much to everyone who was a Patreon patron. I just, it didn't feel like the right fit for my channel at the end of the day. I feel like I want to get more experimental. I want to do more things and it would be cool if the channel made more money. Of course, it's always cool to make money, but I feel like maybe something like super thanks or just videos getting more of an audience. I don't know. We'll see.
but it's not my priority right now. Money is not the priority for the channel. Making the best thing I can make and building a bigger audience for my music is. And so with that in mind, if you'd consider listening to my album, there's something better, I would be honored. If you keep an ear out for my next music, I'm thinking it'll probably start coming out end of this year or sometime in the beginning or middle of next year. I'm not rushing anything because I'm really a big proponent when it comes to those deep creative works of giving them the time they need. YouTube is where I can make things quickly and stay prolific, but with music, I'm really spending time focusing on the craft. Thank you so much, again, one last time, to everyone who's been a friend of the channel, who's commented, watched, liked, subscribed, listened to the music, and shared your experiences. It means a lot. It means, I think, more than I can really put into words. Um, and I'm really excited to see what the future of the channel is. Sorry this video was kind of all over the place, but hopefully it was entertaining, engaging, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll see you next week or sometime soon, and I hope you're doing well. All right. I